Hello everyone and welcome to the final evening lecture series uh, presentation of the 2022 20 right 2022 yes 2023 uh, school year I haven't I'm having a moment um, it's great to have you all with us and so uh, I am Joshua Paxton faculty senate president and so it's my honor to host and and welcome our guest for this evening and so as we get into it, I want to first thank Calvary's Alumni Association for providing tonight's treats for us. And they've been doing that all year long as we have been having this event. And so thank you very much for helping us with that. And then tonight's speaker is Dr. Ian Guthrie. Um, Ian Evans Guthrie has received a nomination for a 2020 award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters first prize for the Academy Comp Ar Arcady. Am I saying it right? Okay. Uh, composition competition, second prize for the American prize, and other accolades for his compositions. Obviously, I am not a music guy. <clears throat> Many of his works have been performed publicly around the world by Fear No Music, the Northwest Symphony Orchestra, the Dakota, Dakota Valley Orchestra, the Moore Philharmonic Orchestra, Valencia International Performing Academy and Festival, the High Score Music Festival, and others. I am not worthy. He has served on various committees, including the National Association of Composers USA, where he is currently the National Treasurer, and the Society of Composers Incorporated, where he has served as the marketer, and before that, the Region for Student Representative. His most recent works include, in, and I'm gonna try, brother, <clears throat> In Paradisum, La Camita, you can correct me when you come up, and Recorder for Choir, a planned project for an orchestra in the KC area, details forthcoming, and some songs based on the poetry of Italian author Renzo Montagnoli. His works are published by Verlag New Music and TUX People's Music. As a pianist, Guthrie uh, has won awards from MTNA, the Great Composer Competition, and others. He also actively researches and analyzes aesthetical and cultural influences in religion and music. So. I think he is more than qualified to speak on tonight's topic. Welcome, Dr. Guthrie. Thank you, Thank you Josh. Uh, so it's ironic, I'm going to be talking about music tonight, sacred music in particular, but I didn't prepare anything to sing for you. So <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer though. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we thank you for all the opportunities you give us to be witnesses to the world in whatever places you have given us. Um, in an increasingly optimistic world in some ways, uh, we want to remember how you have um, given us so many joys on this earth, but also reminders that this isn't eternity, that we are not here forever. And we ask that we would be humbled to focus on that as well as the amazing things you have done in, um, especially for Easter and the like. We thank you for your resurrection, that we will be resurrected one day. Um, we ask that you would focus our minds and hearts towards you, Lord, from me and to anyone listening and the like now or later, that we would all be humbled before you. Pray all these things and those that go and spoken in our hearts in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So, I mean, it's, it, but it is apt that I've given this presentation during Easter, I guess, because, uh, you know, the angel's phrase, he is not here, he is risen, um, became so popular in music that the angel formed a band. And I think you know them as the Rolling Stones. But, uh, <laughs> so, uh, anyway. I sometimes like to start teaching with a little bit of a, a joke. So the eradication of judgment in sacred music. A couple terms I just want to define really quickly for you. Judgment, I mean in the uh, more traditional sense, the holistic sense that we see in Hebrew and Greek uh, that have to do not just with social justice so-called, but the a whole aspect of what is right 
and what is righteous. So I am talking about all, uh, that as part of the term judgment here, not just a legal term. And sacred music, it's not just music from 200 years ago or for, uh, 2,000 years ago, but any music that is serving a religious purpose. So you'll hear me sometimes use these terms, but I'm referring to something broader than what you might automatically think of. But the first question, uh, what really interests me here is, does it matter whether something is sung, said, or read? Is something spoken or sung together more convicting than just listening to a presentation? Through analyzing church traditions, musical styles, and cultural events, political, psychological, and religious, I argue that congregational affirmations of faith, especially through song, are essential to the preservation of sound theological doctrine. Certainly, churches are singing every week around the world, but what are they singing? This article is intended mainly for Protestant and non-denominational audiences, as well as musicians of sacred music, although I think anyone can benefit from it. And this article attempts to highlight the elimination of judgment in Christian music and why this issue is so crucial to theology and well-being, regardless of how progressive or conservative a church may be. And this article is arranged somewhat like a song. The refrain is the references that will keep coming up in different layers about judgment or lack thereof. Um, but then there are various, various sub-points that, for those who are musically inclined, the episodes, so to speak, or the verses and bridges uh, with, the, um, with the main point, the thesis being sort of the refrain or the chorus. So you'll, keep me, you'll he hear things spiral a little bit in this article. It will spiral accumulation of ideas. I first will address the presence of music throughout the Bible, even when it's not explicitly mentioned in the text. I will then briefly address the peripheral questions that may come up, particularly, what about pop music and Christianity? And then third, I will verify the psychological benefits and powers of music interculturally, doesn't matter style, creed, or nationality. The article then summarizes various church traditions, beginning with the least familiar traditions to many, Eastern Orthodox, followed by Protestant, which is more familiar, and then some of the contemporary styles. It proceeds to evaluate traditions of Roman Catholic churches. Um, not super familiar to us in some ways, but we are definitely familiar of the, the critical remarks that we may make about its theology. Uh, John MacArthur is someone that I learned a lot about that from. And also evaluate the historical evolution of the Requiem Mass, though, the funeral service for the Catholics. It, this is usually sung by a choir, though, uh, rather than a congregation, so that does make a difference. But then I'll focus on the lack of judgment in the top 50 contemporary Christian hits on Spotify, YouTube, and iHeartRadio. Um, there's one study done in September 2021, and then uh, I did mine more on the end of 2022. But if you've been listening to the top Christian hits over the last 20 or so years, you'll notice that the subject of judgment has been leaving more and more of these popular songs, which isn't always a bad thing, but when you never have it, it can become a bad thing. Uh, we can also see this trend in many hymnal selections or creations around this time. So it's not just a contemporary church issue. While few Christians like the idea of judgment, um, some may be entirely unaware that the good news has not been contrasted with the law. Or they might be incognizant that singing creates a camaraderie and cognitive process that is not experienced through just simply listening or speaking. And then again, they might intentionally be doing this. There is certainly an objection that it is the outside culture infiltrating the church that causes biblical Christianity to become more conservative or progressive. Uh, but let's consider the power of music, too, and especially that which congregants participate. If there is little congregational participation or few songs being sung, 
then the majority of songs congregates will learn are going to be from outside the church, especially in a world where we have music everywhere. Uh, music doesn't only, isn't the only thing that's affecting church doctrine, but it certainly plays a part. And I don't usually hear people talk about the importance of music, so I, I could be totally unaware that a lot of people are talking about this, but one reason why I did this research is because I don't know of a lot of people doing it. And when I was teaching music philosophy and leadership this past semester, I had a lot of fascinating conversations with students that really got me thinking, what is my philosophy of music really mean? And what do I want to see the next generation of worship leaders doing? And what do I really want church music leaders to be considering no matter where they may fall on the spectrum? Because I think it's bleak for both the conservative and progressive, the Bible, um, the, the traditional Bible affirming and the more um, pr progressive uh, new, newer thought and criticism on the Bible. It's bleak for both. Um, relevance of music within and outside the church is another big question. Where does music come from? And it's interesting, the first mention explicitly of music or instruments is in the line of Cain, Tubal. And this being the first mention, perhaps, and then coupled with the scant mentions of music in the New Testament. We have Romans 12, of course, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3. Um, this may lead people to think, well, maybe music is just overrated for the church service. But on the contrary, I'm going to say the Bible is full of sacred music. And entire books were meant to be sung. Of course, the Psalms. But then some Jewish synagogues, including at least the conservative Jewish synagogue of the United States, they will sing or chant every scripture that they read, anything from the Tanakh. So that could be anything from Obadiah or books maybe you haven't heard of yet, all the, which are still in the, the, the Bible, but uh, all the way to the Psalms. Jesus, St. Paul, and others quoted the Old Testament ex extensively. First with the Psalms, then next in lines Isaiah, and then I believe Jeremiah's third that they quoted. But all of these have a lot of poetry in them and were likely meant to be sung in part or maybe in entirety, according to certain traditions. Uh, Jesus sang a hymn with his disciples when they mount, went to Mount Olivet. Paul commanded churches that whenever ye may come together, each of you hath a psalm. Let all things be for building up. 1 Corinthians 14, 26, and that's the YLT, the Young's Literal Translation. The Ephesians were told to speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Ephesians 5.19, again from the Young literal, Young's Literal Translation. The Colossians were to be admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Colossians 3.16. And likewise, James asked, Is anyone in good cheer? Let him sing psalms. James 5.13. The Apocalypse of John also reveals many songs in heaven. But then there's also some mentions in the New Testament that are more subtle, such as Ephesians 5.14 and Philippians 2, 4-11. Paul composed these passages much as he did his citations from the Psalms or Prophets, and some scholars believe he's actually citing early hymns based on the Old Testament. As this article will exemplify, not only are there many passages in Scripture that are song-like without explicitly stating such, but there are traditions in Jewish, Christian, Islamic, and other religions that provide parameters to sing and or chant the Scriptures. Music is a powerful tool, and of course it could be used for ill. I don't need to give examples of where it's promoting things that are promiscuous or the like, or secular. Uh, but unfortunately, there are many dogmas, practices, creeds, and the like that are discouraging, unethical, unbiblical, and yet labeled Christian because the artist said so. Uh, there are unequivocal disagreements on what, what Christian music is between world churches and what music should be used, which is also an issue. Um, but one of these big quibbles is contemporary music as a style. So Christi contemporary Christian music. And I read many articles by conservative theological journals that have argued for or against certain types of sacred music, particularly contemporary Christian music and contemporary rap. Uh, no matter how you feel about those styles, uh, most of these articles attack or 
hail the aesthetical styles and their connotations. So, for example, contemporary Christian music. This is, it draws in, it's influence from rock stars who are promiscuous individuals, right? So the, the music must have some of that in there too. Uh, unfortunately, this is kind of myopic, uh, at least considering the style is not always associated with lifestyle. And frankly, uh, when we look at rock history, funny enough, what it was known to promote is actually not the lifestyle many of the popular artists lived. So those who favor certain religious works by artists also would say uh, they equate the aesthetic impact with a religious fervor. Someone said of Beethoven, his Mises Solemnis is this amazing work that you have to listen to so spiritually enhancing. Um, if you're curious, Beethoven actually changed uh, some of the words of some of his liturgical works um, to be rather um, universalistic. So both groups are erring. One says, well, musical connotations tell us how Christian the music is. The other is saying, well, if it's aesthetically pleasing, then it must be a religious fervor of the composer. Uh, both are incorrect. The top Christian songs of the 20th and 21st centuries, however, never promote drugs, alcohol, or lasciviousness. Uh, this is what is perceived of rock, rap, and other genres, and usually that is the case. But on the contrary, many of these hits are deeply personal to the authors in these contemporary genres and celebrate freedom from these addictions and sins. And furthermore, the attackers against Christian styles fail to realize that secular and sacred musical practices have influenced each other for millennia. We may never reach a conclusion exactly what came first, but uh, this has happened with, say, the classic Greek songs, um, b about 300 BC to 300 AD. Euripides plays, there's also religious songs that have a very similar vein at that time that were strictly for the Greek religion. Uh, Phil and Gail Newman are some of the experts I learned this from. They, they travel around the world talking about ancient music. We also have the medieval music of Cathedral of Notre Dame, um, about 1150 to 1250 is this famous era of polyphony, so-called. So multiple parts harmony being invented around this time. But around the same time, you have the English song Sumere Zakuminin from about 1250. So depending on when you date these, they're they're, the similar ideas are coming at the same time. The Renaissance madrigals and chansons, or secular songs, of the 1500s are very similar to the masses by, uh, written by someone named Palestrina. And the origin of many Protestant tunes, like Amazing Grace, comes from things like drinking songs. So uh, think about that next time you're singing Amazing Grace. Uh, the stylistic similarities between secular and sacred music probably begin at the beginning of time. Uh, uh, my last truth here that summarizing all of this. The one exception that I can think of would be the monophonic a cappella tradition of early Christian music and other religious traditions that picked up somewhat. But people such as Clement of Alexandria and Basil the Great um, didn't want instruments at all in their music because in their day, instruments represented the Greek and Roman pagan practices. So they wanted to rid anything that reminded them of secular or pagan society. And that still isn't something that's commonly practiced today with the exception of chants in intermittently put in certain churches. But that's the one exception I can really think of where I don't find a lot of historical trends doing that. Um, when we get into the early secular songs that are recorded, we still have instruments presumed to be used. So there aren't a lot of times in history where we haven't had similar aesthetical styles between music. Uh, there, can, there can be, uh, there, there could still be importance about aesthetical appeal though. I just wanna say, I don't think that we shouldn't worry about it at all, but we shouldn't worry about it as a point of judgment because if mu contemporary music distracts someone or hymns distract someone during worship, that's not a problem. There's no prescription in the Bible about what style of music to do. There's only a prescription not to judge someone on non-essential topics like in Colossians 3 or Romans 14. 
So whatever style is used, it should enhance worship and not distract from it. So I just want to say, I know people will talk, uh, talk about different styles as an issue, and I focus on a lot of different styles in here, although I, cum I culminate with the contemporary music. Psychology. Uh, while some have said this can help with Alzheimer's, it can be a better tool of communication, more research needs to be done. It's not as verifiable, but it does seem to show the mentally challenged uh, can benefit from music as a tool of communication and participation. It's not always the most beautiful music, it's not always the same style, but it allows a form of communication when otherwise they might not understand or comprehend what someone is saying as an active tool. For example, this one study by Nancy A. Jackson, um, she looked at several individuals who were dealing with schizophrenia, and one of the examples I include in here is two individuals, Chuck and Jeff, who became friends by being forced to sit at a xylophone and start playing. And eventually, she noticed they started to communicate things with them and develop this friendship that they might not have had a lot of talking, per se, but they certainly understood each other at a deeper level through the music. And I think that is uh, one example of many stories that pastors and church uh, councils and the like can consider when they think about what is too much singing and is it maybe worth doing more things in a song-like fashion especially if it has a possibility a good possibility of communicating better to those who are mentally challenged within the congregation notice that style is not the issue uh, Nicholas Sienkiewicz I believe is how you pronounce it and the biochemical power of choral singing showed that choral singing helped with a more powerful bonding than informal group conversations. It increased the positive emotions and decreased the negative emotions during the process. And third, he f uh, proved that humans are more attached to their positive and negative emotions while singing as a choir. And by extension, we could think congregation. This isn't new with Sienkiewicz, but it is certainly, uh, he's certainly verifying something that has been surmised for much longer than it's been proven. And he's just one of many sources verifying this. He himself admits that he doesn't have huge sample sizes for his studies, but I don't think he really needs it because we also have church uh, fathers writing about similar ideas. We also have people like Moshe Ben Simon, who is a professor at Bar Ilan University, and he interviewed some people in some Israeli protests during 2012 and the like, uh, a lot of protests about the Gaza border and the like. The protesters were not allowed to go about a certain point, so they started finding solidarity in their singing. Uh, so powerful was the singing that the guards started to join in. And so powerful was that that the people stopped singing because they did not want to assent to whatever their opponents were doing. They did not want solidarity with their opponents. And there are many other examples I could come up with. Uh, Alexander the Great decided to go to war after hearing a tune in what we would call the minor mode. Uh, Acts 19 includes hours of chanting, Great is Diana or Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh, 2020 witnessed a ton of chanting and singing related to the Black Lives Matter protests. And these are only three instances where music chanting community created a solidarity that strengthened a faith in a cause, policy, or religion. Regardless of genre, style, or the like, there is a clear communal power of music, as opposed to spoken monologue or dialogue. These examples, it's not just one person singing or one person chanting, it's everyone doing it. And, when, and so having everyone do it, they are assenting to that in a more active role than if they're just passively saying yes. And then we have, in religion, Basil the Great in the homily on Psalm 1 summarizes the psalm quite well. I will not read all of this for you, but it shows that already the early church was aware of this. He noted how the psalm implies serenity of the soul. It is the author of peace, which calms bewildering and seething soul, so, thoughts. It softens the wrath of the soul and what is unbridled it chastens. A psalm forms friendships. How can he who has uttered the same prayer to God be at en enemy, enmity with someone? 
moving on, says things such as, it brightens feast, feast days. It creates a sorrow which is in accordance with God. A song calls forth a tear even from the heart of stone. A psalm is the work of angels, a heavenly institution, the spiritual incense. It is the voice of the church. St. Augustine of Hippo uh, also wrote that uh, mu music was more moving than the words, and so he thought that churches should only be singing from the Bible, particularly the psalms, and not pollute themselves with words that are distracting. John Calvin had many great things to say in the Institutes as, and other sources about music and the like. But perhaps the most succinct is from his introduction to the Psalter from 1543. It is true that every bad word, as St. Paul has said, perverts good manner. But when the melody is with it, it pierces the heart much more strongly and enters into it. If this is true, then Christian leaders ought to be deliberate about what they sing even more than what they preach. Islam also has these laws. Uh, Sama forbids listening to music, especially secular music, and Gina is considered secular music. However, most strands of Islam will allow for religious cantillation and folk songs that are edifying and accompanied hymns. And so they see singing, the only, sometimes the only place certain strands will allow music, as we would call it, is in their religious services. So they clearly see a power of music and they don't want it abused for anything except a sacred setting. This might sound so legalistic, Dr. Guthrie. Uh, what, uh, but think about what is the freedom that we've allowed in the church maybe caused? The freedom of what we write, what we can say in our hymns. There's a lot of great things. But are we maybe emphasizing too much the Christian walk or just God's greatness? Are we aware of where we put ourselves in ecstasy and worship and song? Are we only putting it in ecstasy when it's about a trial overcome or the goodness of God, how great God is, which are all true, which are all great, which are all, we're all really thankful for, but is it the only thing about God or the Christian walk that we need to highlight? Because music indeed whoops, serves some of these roles that are sort of problematic in, uh, or convicting in humanistic settings. Social justice and environmentalism. I've heard and seen people talk about this, the power of music in these settings. Uh, I do want to say I do believe we are to be good stewards of the earth and we are also to promote true justice. But as, you, as I imply, this also has been used in very unchristian ways, but they're still using music for something that they're not proud of necessarily, but they are ready to do something about it. So having talked about all these different styles and all these settings, I want to give a perspective on some of the different worship traditions, just bird's eye view of how they work, because this plays into perhaps how certain denominations are interacting with their music and their theology and how those might be intermixed. The Orthodox Church is far outnumbered in the Western world by Roman Catholic, Protestant, and non-denominational churches. And it's actually multiple independent synods. But there are some generalizations I can make, such as first, most of the service is sung including the prayers, including the chants. Um, the texts usually include at least one Old Testament reading that is sung, an epistle reading that is sung, and a gospel reading that's also sung. The prayers can include prayers to saints, unsurprisingly imprecatory and penitential petitions and other topics. Um, it is un unabashedly anachronistic and chant-like and the Orthodox Church of America openly opposes music for the sake of fulfilling anyone's personal taste. So I don't know if it's gonna change anytime soon. For those of you looking for an Eastern Orthodox Church, ch trying to change it to have a contemporary worship style, don't know if that's gonna happen. Um, while some might find this Orthodox experience to be too arcane, it certainly has merits. First, most everything in the service is done through congregational chanting and singing 
meaning everyone absorbs this scripture and this teaching and ritual in a much more piercing fashion, to use Calvin's terms. Most church traditions don't do it to this extent. Second, its musical style feels almost otherworldly that might be very effective in a film score, creating an atmosphere where the music, reverence, and ritual can be united in our minds as a space that's sacred. As a third benefit, Orthodox Church tradition as well will ch it has been changing very slowly and singing and enchanting similarly to what they have over millennium. If this is true, then it seems other denominations should want their churches singing more and maybe even following a stricter liturgy to keep everything intact. There's, of course, the objection that some of Anglican, Episcopal, and Roman Catholic high liturgy church traditions uh, have changed more drastically, yet some of them sound this way musically. But look also at the songs they're singing or the words they don't sing anymore or the words they've taken out of their hymnals. It often goes part and parcel. As far as I know, the Eastern Orthodox Church still sings hymns that they have for over, well over a thousand years. So I will discuss some of these other churches in the Protestant and Roman Catholic ca categories. But very similar to this orthodox practice is, as I mentioned earlier, that some Jewish uh, synagogues, such as the conservative Jews in the United States, they don't, uh, they don't recite anything from their readings. They'll usually have a reading from the Law of Moses and something else, but it's all chanted and sung to a tune. Doesn't matter how unpoetic it is. And again, this is a friend of mine of no insignificant status in the conservative Jewish tradition. Uh, I continue to pray for him and his salvation, but he's, he's in a pretty high, uh, high place. So I don't think taking his ideas at, as uh, among other Jewish scholars and musicians is a bad idea. So we, uh, we have these examples, but then when we get to the Protestant and Roman Catholic hymns, we get to a little more familiar territory. A hymn is usually something we use if it's a worship song that's not a contemporary worship song. Uh, and most denominations organize their hymnals according to the church calendar. Whoops, I'm way behind. Okay, so this could include Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Transfiguration. A lot of di a lot of different parts of the year of the year, but also topics such as grace, marriage, and reverence for the saints in the church. This could be as simple as for all the saints in a Protestant church, where we remember those who are now sainted because uh, they have gone before us to be with the Lord. Not necessarily a reverence for saints in a, a worshiping sort of fashion. And there, there in some hymnals. There's categories of social justice and the like. But focus on some of these lesser ones, like marriage. Could singing hymns about marriage and creating a communal sense of that change anything in our, at our churches or what people teach or the like? Then there's also the mass ordinary derived from the Catholic tradition. The Kyrie, the Lord have mercy, is how they usually start the surface. The Gloria, glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Um, the credo, which I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and of earth and all things visible and invisible. Uh, the Sanctus, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The Benedictus, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Agnus Dei, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us, grant us peace. Then you also have a Mass proper, which is you, the gradual that precedes the reading of the gospel, as well as an offertory, which is often sung when the offering is taken. But through this mass ordinary example, which is the same year out, uh, and the mass proper, which stays similar, we see a move from a penitential mode to a mode of rejoicing. And so they still, in theory, practice a, a more holistic view of the Christian walk. But the Requiem Mass that I want to use as an example for the Catholic Church is very interesting because it exemplifies something that has not been carried over from the Protestants. And in its origins, it's actually, I think, a, a great text, even though 
Some of it is not biblical, and a lot of it's a paraphrase of the Bible. I think it has a very noble idea of starting with the, the reverence for God as the one who preserves and takes life, and a petition that God remembers us and that God will, uh, will take us into paradise when we die, awaiting the, um, the, the resurrection of the dead and the new heavens and new earth. Um, there are various, uh, there are a lot of sections here. Uh, Nicholas Slonimsky of the past century said, it usually had a new requiem eternum, eternal rest, followed the dies irae is the next part, the day of wrath, and various sequences, which are just sections such as Domine Jesu Christe, Lord Jesus Christ, Sanctus, and Agnus Dei, which were discussed earlier, the Holy, 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 and Lamb of God. And this is the model from which I chart these examples from Mozart, Verdi, Berlioz, and Ferre, which are some of the most famous requiems. And if you saw our Masterworks concert last December, we sang the Ferre Requiem. Notably, you, you see a lot of similarities here and then some that are lacking. But most notably, the Ferre lacks Dies Irae, the Day of Wrath. It lacks the Tuba Miriam, the, tr the magnificent trumpet call, the Rex Tremende Majestasis, the Tremendous and Majestic King. Quarens me, search me, O Lord. Recordare ye zu pie, remember me, pious Jesus. And Lacrimosa Dies Ila. Oh, that sad, that sad day, I, I mourn at that sad day is the idea. He does have Pie Jesu, which is somewhat similar to some of these. Um, and he has the In Paradisu. And he does have the Libera Me, which does have some things to do with the uh, Day of Wrath a little bit. But In Paradisu, he was the first of his type to put In Paradisu in there. And many scholars think that this could be an ascent to universalism, that I don't really want to focus on the judgment, I just want to focus on the paradise side of everything. Uh, even more radical, though, is Johannes Brahms. In a German requiem, he intended it, so he says, to be more of a humanistic requiem, remembering those who have died from the earthly death and focused very little on the spiritual afterlife. And ironically though, he chooses biblical texts. It's not just paraphrases, actual biblical texts. But if instead of ending life in paradise with the Lamb of God, he ends with blessed are the dead in the Lord from now on. And the 20th century, we've got a lot of ideas. We've got the Requiem Canticles by Igor Stravitsky and others that are pretty traditional. But then we have people such as Benjamin Britten, who combined the Requiem texts and secular poetry on World War I to make a comment on war. Uh, another person, Stephen Montague, who was actually one of my teachers, he wrote something called, I Heard a Trumpet Calling Them to the Other Side, which he subtitled the Requiem. But he openly says he is not a Christian and he doesn't intend it for me to be a Christian text. He saw Requiem as a term that's now become something for dead people, essentially. So we're seeing um, Ferrey, Stravitsky, Britain, and maybe Brahms claiming to be Christians, but then we have non-Christians. Someone named Lordson's also written one. Montague, Rudder, I've heard, has claimed not to be a Christian, for those of you who know the music of Rudder, John Rudder. But they're, ta they're, they're taking these, some of them are writing more traditional versions of the Requiem, some are not, and they're taking a Christian genre and calling this Christian because they say it's Christian or because they want to adopt it. And so we've got a little bit of an issue here where secularism is representing Roman Catholicism and it's become a skeleton of what it once was. I think this is important to know that the Re Requiem Mass is following a trajectory much like what we see in the visible, at least what the news represents of the Catholic Church right now. 
Um, thankfully, though, the Requiem is usually sung by choirs. What about in, uh, in congregations? What's happening with hymns? Well, the Presbyterian Church USA in 2013 realized uh, In Christ Alone was in their hymnal, and they, they were dealing with some ideas. What do we really do with the judgment of God? And that's a, a valid question especially people who grew up maybe in a Catholic situation. Uh, what do we do about the judgment of God? They wanted to change the words in the song from the wrath of God was satisfied to the love of God was magnified. The writers said no, so the church said, let's put this out of our hymnal. It doesn't fit with our theology. And so you got to give them credit in some way. They're saying, we're not going to allow anyone other than our church councils to decide what's in our hymnals. We're not going to let our hymnals represent something we don't believe. And we're not going to allow other influences just to say, these songs are going to be in your hymnal. I want to do these. They are trying to base their hymnal on their theology. But then we have issues such as... Um, they're stripping the, the hymnal of what was traditional in Christianity. So could there be more linked here than just their theology changed? Could it be they don't like the songs they're singing? They realize we don't like to sing about God's judgment. So we're going to change our theology, which necessitates a change in repertoire, if not tradition. And then it leads me to ask, though, just as we noticed in the larger scale, Composers who aren't Christians are writing requiems. What are the backgrounds of our hymn writers or our contemporary Christian music friends and favorites? Are they really Christian? Just because they compose a song that uses words that sound Christian. And this leads me to the contemporary service, which has longer sermons and much less music, which is great if the preacher has a lot to say about the Bible and exegetes the Bible, but we get a lot of things where people aren't assenting as a congregation to many of these precepts. They are saying, yes, we agree, but they're only assenting to what they're singing to. That's the only congregational process in most contemporary churches I've been in anyway. Um, and we've also developed this false dichotomy as, as much as I, I, um, I love the idea of there being a personal song versus a congregational song, I for a long time believed that I think things should be sung congregationally, especially those that are personal, because we don't find solidarity when we only do things on our own and we don't have anyone to stand by us. We may find a solidarity, solidarity we didn't know existed when we sing something that's very personal and someone else assents to it with us. So just like when we're talking about it, we find someone else is dealing with the same thing we are. Imagine doing that in the setting of church in song, finding that. Unfortunately, though, this, is, this personal verse congregational song has led many congregants to sing about God's greatness and vague journeys to Christian bliss, as I like to call it. Um, is this the first step in a new theology? And, you know, you might say, no, this, this, can't, this can't be. No, no. But this, and this isn't just in the contemporary churches, though. Uh, there, it's happening with hymnal choices. I think churches should be shunning this, but instead they're adopting these hymns, modernizing their liturgies, and we're getting a neutral position, uh, you know, neutral orthodoxy in our songs, and a neutral orthopraxy. We're not singing about what's orthodox, but we're not doing anything heterodox either. We're not singing about social justice one way or the other. And does this, what does this do? Um, it certainly is liberating us from singing about this judgment and expecting the pastor, rightly so, to preach about the whole counsel of God. But it shouldn't be the pastor's responsibility, I don't think. Um, it should not be... Uh, just the congregation listening. They should be actively participating in this. I realize I have way too much to say, so I will get through this, though. Don't worry. I'm just not going to mention every word on here. So 
we find songs being selected that people want to sing. Yay, we can sing Kumbaya all together, or one billion people, or two billion. Sermons are not what people want to hear, but should this dichotomy really exist? You know, aesthetically, this certainly can draw younger generations. But churches do have the resource, many churches do have musicians in them who are capable to write a decent song that sets the words we need to be singing. Our church fathers argued that music had a say in the matter of our services, and I think we need to be aware that church, some churches are intentionally avoiding this, this conviction, because it is catchy not to have that conviction. Uh, but what happens when you don't have these songs? And I'm just going to give some brief examples. I know in, some of these are my own experience. One is social justice is legalism. My church that I grew up in never sang about social justice. So when I was talking about uh, serving the community and making that a big part of my faith, besides just believing the orthodoxy about God, I was um, condemned as being legalistic about Christianity and no longer being a grace-filled Christian. Um, the church I grew up in never highlighted women, especially in their songs. But I found there is... Uh, that there is sort of a shunning, I think, of women in, in some of the, in the settings I grew up in to where I came to another church and we sang a hymn on Mother's Day about all the faithful women in the Bible. And I never really thought until that point, you know, these people really need to be remembered and, uh, and respected for the sake of the whole congregation, not just me, not just the women in the congregation, not just here or there, everybody. Um, Another example, in 2019, I remember just listening to some songs in Hillsong Church from North Carolina, because I wanted to list some sermons while I was out of the country. Um, they proposed endorsing, uh, you know, sinful marriages, but their songs never talked anything about marriage. So it's kind of easy for a pastor to talk to a congregation about something you never talk about and certainly never sing about as we should do this because these people are great. Let's, uh, but we've totally forgotten that God instituted marriage. It's not, it's, it's not a human institution. It's God's institution. And we should be singing to assent to that ourselves, I think. And then we've seen the similar thing happen in some of the middle of the road United Methodist churches having these kind of discussions. Uh, and then I don't have much time, but I do want to talk about the best hits are certain. What are some of the examples of these best hits that we're singing? Uh, in 2021, the top 25 CCLI hits mentioned justice one time. No mention of poor or needy. No, mention, no questions for God. Forget Job. Few enemies. Forget David. Um, an emotional picture of the Christian walk. So forget those days when your emotions deceive you. In my research in 2022, it wasn't any better. It was kind of worse. Couldn't find the word judgment, justice, or sin in the CCLI, Billboard, Spotify, or iHeart one top hits at all. Some fail to mention God, Father, Son, or Spirit. Said this is a vague deity. Um, traditionalist Christians, and really anyone I would imagine, are these Christian songs at all? Like, I mean, Africa by Toto mentions salvation and seeking wise counsel. Can't that be Christian in that case? We also have unorthodoxy because hell has become a code word and expletive in our culture and we don't talk about it in church a lot. It's become indeed an expletive and a, a word of question in a lot of these songs of contemporary music. And if, if I want to make you even angrier, the Bible I, re I read is a phrase that someone mentions in their songs. They're not referring to the Bible, but they're saying, I am the Bible they read, talking about I am kind of a witness to the world. Well, hopefully you're a good witness, but hopefully you don't think you're the new Bible. Uh, and so, is the, sometimes the, the legal shackles we've shaken off, is this perhaps... Um, rewriting the Bible and hurting our testimony? Is it worth singing songs that are maybe a little bit more convicting and have uh, you know, a more 
a, a more critical attitude about this. Because conservatives, we are singing songs that may very well um, oppose our theology, but at the very least doesn't promote it in, in, in any strong fashion one way or the other. And the progressive churches, they're losing songs about social justice. They're both important. And I, I, I of course, assent to a very conservative, hyper-conservative biblical framework, I think. But this is not just a problem that, uh, contemporary Christian music isn't just causing problems for, uh, for cont conservative Christians, Bible-believing Christians, like uh, places at Calvary. It's causing a problem for the uh, more progressive churches too. And the people there are not really sure what the Bible says or what the theolo theology is, other than what's said from the pulpit. It's, uh, so all that we learn about theology is said from the pastor. Um, so, give me a, I'm almost done, I promise. Um, let's first remember then that this is not a progressive versus conservative or liturgical versus fundamentalist kind of discussion or the like. This is not a discussion of, well, as long as we don't, ascend, we're not part of that denomination, uh, that's not the scope of this article. The point is there are pros and cons in a lot of these traditions, but we need to be aware of the most important point I'm trying to make here is that I think the lack of singing on some of these t topics in the Bible as a congregation is perhaps leading to poor theology either in person and in individuals or in larger groups when we might not be aware of it. Uh, we could, of course, um, quote the obvious, let's just maintain the status quo. Um, Option two, we could change theology to reflect song choices. Um, no hyper-conservative or hyper-progressive church would ever admit to doing something like that, but it does happen. Option three, require seminary and music majors to partake in creating new songs based on biblical texts. Again, most of the sources I look for to find these settings of the Bible are generic chant tunes in my hymnals, or the Orthodox Church has a ton of them, a, a much bigger tradition of it. But we don't have a resource that's even up to date with our hymnals, let alone contemporary Christian music. So having students partake in events to create this repertoire. Uh, one of my students last semester, um, many of you here at Calvary know Chris Stolberg, and he wrote a worship song under my supervision, but his whole goal was to fit some of this, and we've sang it once or twice. And I think it represents a big step in what I'm thinking. It doesn't, you don't have to impact the whole world, but you can start impacting your community with it. Um, and encourage church members to combine forces to create new songs. If you're in a church like mine, a lot of the members are a little bit older, but some of them have an interest in working with youth, working with music, given the opportunity, and the opportunities can be there. So there are people in the church that can hopefully help with this. Option four, choose songs based on lyrics, combine styles, whether that's to represent diversity or just because this is where you can find those lyrics. I think this, this is the, these last two, if you, if you didn't get it already, I don't believe in the first two options that much, but I, I do kind of believe in the last two. Um, but the reality is that Christian music is being secular, secularized and neutralized. The chosen worship songs and services are often one-sided, things that bring us joy and contentment, which are great, but that's not all that matters and all that's relevant to once we become Christians or even before we're Christians. Music subconsciously influences the beliefs and attitudes of people. Sometimes a protest or just a general statement, when it's sung, we find ourselves more bought into it and I don't believe emotion, of course, is a guidance, but I think God gave us an emotion for that reason. He wants us to give us gifts and tools to buy into some of these things that maybe we struggle with. So the question I leave us with is, are churches, are go are churches going to face this predicament or flee from it? Because it's, it's, not, it, it's not a neutral situation. It'll go one way or the other. So with that, that, that is the final question we all have to decide in our congregations as leaders or as lay people. Um, are we going to face this predicament and do something about it or are we going to flee from it? Thank you very much. We have a few minutes. Does anybody have any questions for Ian? Nope, nobody's got 
done. You must have answered them all, Ian. So um, I find it interesting is one of, you know, one of the things that I have always often thought about within culture and intercultural studies as it's related to, to music. And I'm <clears throat> going to go out on a limo a little bit here, but um, I'll, I'll compare it with inner city music. And as the culture begins to sing certain songs, and then the next generation is enculturated through those songs, and music has a big impact on their enculturation process and how they grow up and what they learn, and then their behavior begins to reflect the things that they are singing about as a result of those songs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, for example, you have, you know, kids growing up in the inner city who may be singing songs related to drugs or going to jail or et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. And they're being enculturated into that through the songs that they are singing. And then their behavior lines up with that as a product of the enculturation process. Mm -hmm. um, is that similar to what you see reflected here in the church where you know a generation is growing up within the church they're singing particular songs it's part of the enculturation process within the church and that is then affecting their discipleship and their behavior i think absolutely we have that issue i think the the church traditions uh for lack of a better word that we grow up in plays a huge part in what is natural to us as Christians. So even as born again Christians, uh, young or older, what we, what we heard in the church, if we grew up in the church early on, is always something we have to break from. And I think the song is one of the most powerful parts of that. So it doesn't mean we're stuck believing those things, but I know for me anyway, it's still weird for me to think about singing a personal song as a congregation, but I know it's uh, helpful. But I grew up not doing that, so it's not first nature, it's not, um, it's, it's not second nature to me, excuse me. So I think it plays a big part, and we, we certainly see the world creating songs to teach kids that are not Christian and not Christian concepts, but I think we need to be aware of that and have ideas how to deal with that, have ideas how to deal with that also for people who are 